Starts out, says, on the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again, and his disciples heard it. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple, and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought uh, in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house, for, uh, a house of prayers for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it, and they were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away at its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God, truly I say to you, Whoever says to the mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt it in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whenever you ask in prayer, believe that you will receive it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you of your trespasses. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, God, we come to you this morning, Lord, just thanking you for um, the ability and the opportunity, Lord, to uh, be in your house. Um, God, we just ask that you would take a moment to uh, free our hearts and free our minds, uh, Lord, so that we could be acceptive of your word, um, that we could take uh, what your word tells us to be able to apply it to our, uh, our hearts, Lord, so that we could be different people uh, when we leave here than as we came in. Lord, I also ask that you would please be with Timothy as he brings the message. Um, give him the, the words to say to, uh, to reach us. Um, God, I just ask, Lord, that uh, you would please be with our missionaries, our, all of our outreach ministries. Lord, help us to be able to uh, be bold and uh, mindful and uh, knowledgeable of your word, Lord, and to be able to help others understand who Jesus is, and what he done for us on the cross. God, we love you. We thank you so much for this day and uh, for all that you've done for us and all you're going to do. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Matt, uh, for reading that for us. We are uh, still in the book of Mark. And uh, this is a really, I guess, familiar passage that you've probably heard before, um, and there's also a lot of conversation, especially in the, uh, the past year or so, that, that kind of surrounds this, and um, it's one of those things that, as I studied, there were, were a lot of different approaches and, and different ways we could look at this and, and kind of mine things out of it. Um, and so, hopefully, we'll, we'll get to and to touch on some of those things. Um, but I, I want to keep uh, the main thing, the, the main thing, as they say. Um, and uh, so that's what we'll try to do this morning. But um, as I, I studied this passage this week, uh, I was reminded of, of course, a meme. I told you guys I really like memes, um, and I saw a story. And uh, many of you are familiar with uh, this meme that people share, and they, they change the captions, and this is known as Success Kit. And uh, as I was studying, uh, I came across uh, some information about this, and it was very interesting. And uh, so I wanted to start by just sharing that with you this morning. Um, in 2007, 11-month-old Sam Griner uh, which is this child that's older, much older now, um, but he was eating sand on a beach, and, and 
I had never even noticed that in his hand is sand. I, that, that always passed me by for some reason. Uh, but he's holding sand, and uh, this picture was from where his parents took him to the beach in 2007 and, and had him on the beach, and they had just bought a new camera. And so the, the mom is taking pictures of the beach and of their trip to the beach together as a family, and she snapped this photo, and she posted it on her Flickr account. And she, she said that within a year, uh, she had thought nothing of it, but uh, within a year, people had started making this image into memes. And so you may have seen some of these. Uh, I'll put this one in there for, for Adam. It says, uh, ate spaghetti in a white shirt and didn't get sauce on it. Uh, so there's success. And then this next one we can all identify with if you've been driving down the road and there's a bee in the car. Uh, rolled down the window to let out a bee, and the bee flew out, which is awesome. That's always a good thing, uh, because then you're not trying to dodge and, and weave while uh, driving in traffic. So, uh, But she said that after she had posted this to Flickr, um, it became this meme. And, and really, at, at this point, memes were so new that her and her husband really didn't know what to make of this. And so they started looking up other memes and, and they, they kind of got worried because a lot of memes are, are funny and, and harmless, but there are some that are, are kind of negative, that are, are actually harmful. And, and so they were kind of worried about, well, what's going to happen with this picture of our little boy? Um, and, and she made the statement in an interview that, that she was in that said, we, we knew it was out there, but there was nothing we could do because the internet had it. Young people, you need to hear that. This is a side note this morning. That once you take pictures and, and you post those, and once you take words and, and phrases, and, and once we put things out there, it's out there. And a lot of times you, you can't recover those and get those back. They're out there for the world to see. But she said that the, the internet had it, and so they were very worried and concerned about what, what's going to happen to this image with their child. But fortunately, what did happen and what really kind of stuck and, and what began to trend was this image of Success Kid. And she said it was really fitting um, because this, this image is kind of this positive message um, it's kind of about um, celebrating even the, the small things in, in your life, but it's also about overcoming um, big obstacles. And so she said it, it was fitting because Sam, when he was born, he was born prematurely. And he had a lot of health complications when he was born. And then when he was six weeks old, he had brain surgery and uh, had to undergo brain surgery. And so there was a, a time where they were thinking, you know, the odds are against this kid. Um, but he, he made it. And so they said, we identified that. That, that resonated with us. And, and him being a, a picture of, of beating the odds and of being successful. And so they were very grateful that this is the version that, that took off. Um, and, and so I kept watching this interview of, of this family, and, and it got even more heartwarming. Um, because several years later, uh, Sam's father uh, got diagnosed with chronic kidney disease. And so uh, he was on dialysis for several years. Um, he had about 20% kidney function, and he really needed a, a kidney transplant. But the family really couldn't afford that because the, the cost of the anti-rejection drugs were, were so great that they just couldn't proceed with that. And so they started a GoFundMe uh, campaign. And the mom sent out a tweet and says, if everyone who created a Success Kid meme donated $1, we could save Success Dad's life. And within one week of tweeting this, and within one week of opening this GoFundMe, they were able to uh, successfully go through with the operation. Uh, the dad was able to receive a, a kidney and afford the, the medication, and everything is, is good now. And so th this eventually turned into this meme, uh, made enough money from this meme to fund my dad's kidney transplant. And it's, it's got that picture of, of success. 
And so as I was studying and as I was looking at, at all of this stuff um, this week, I was reminded that knowing the context of, of something um, can really change our perspective. It really changes how we, we see things, how we interpret things, how we think through things and, and respond to, to issues and, and images and all of these things that we're surrounded with. Um, and, and memes are often funny, um, and they're often something we like because uh, we can put in our, our own context. And so there's like these meme generators where you can go and find these images and, and the backgrounds are blank and you can kind of provide the, the dialogue. Um, what's going on here? What this image is supposed to portray or, or what's happened here? And, and there's even games. Um, I, I think we have uh, what would you meme uh, at the house or it's around somewhere, but it, there are even games that people play where you provide the context of, of the picture. You provide... Uh, what this is actually saying. And so, when we look at this, we, we don't see a child eating sand, but we see this kid that is overcoming the odds, that is really excited that uh, they've managed to make it through something. And our interpretations and, and our statements and these ideas that we have that, that we put out there, um, a lot of times they can take off. And they, they spread, and so people will click like, and they'll click share on, on Facebook, or, or they'll retweet something that we've said or, or posted, and, and they take off. And Dr. Joan Donovan, a research director at Harvard Shorenstein Center, uh, I was reading something that she had published, and it said, ultimately, uh, you are the product, not the consumer. And I read that, and I was like, wow, there, that makes a lot of sense. And what she means by that is the memes that we, we share, the, the Facebook posts that we share, uh, the retweets that we do, when, when we see these icons and these images or these statements, all of these different things that we're sharing, we're, we're not the end of that, but we're means to further distribution of, of that idea, right? And, and so um, if we think about this with a, a church bent, um, we actually become in a way, evangelist of some kind of idea. Are, are you following that? We, we are spreading out information. We're sharing with others uh, some statement or some idea as we share those things. And so we're, we're not the end. We're, we're a means of further distribution. Um, in memetics, this is actually called amplification. And memetics is the study of, of how cultural ideas and information is, is passed in society. And it was coined in 1976 by Richard Dawkins. Um, but this is not a, a new concept. And I, I find this so cool. Um, God beat him to the punch. Um, this is why God says we have to handle his word rightly, that we need to be careful about han handling God's word. In 2 Timothy 2, 15 through 17, it says this, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth, but avoid irrelevant babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. So you can see that whole concept is in Scripture, that we have to be careful with what we are, are sharing, with what we are communicating to people, because they take that and they share it with other people. So it, it spreads. Ideas spread. We, we transfer information. We are actually transmitters of information. And if you think about that in the history of Scripture, if you think about that in the grand meta-narrative of the Bible, that's what God made us to be, right? Because when, when He made Adam and Eve in the garden, um, we, we find that God made man in His image and His likeness to, to be His representatives, to be His ambassadors on the earth. And so everywhere we go, God's intention was that we would portray who God is, what God is, is like, and how we uh, re interact with the world and society around us. We represent who God is and what God has said. And so the best way we can do this, the, the best way we can transmit this information is through discipleship. And we've talked about that um, over the past few months, we've, we've mentioned discipleship and what that is and having relationships with people and having conversations um, with people. And the thing is, we are 
guilty of, of trying to subtly kind of substitute that for, for something else. And uh, this is something that I call discipleship by osmosis. And so if you think about that, what we're doing is we are, are trying to leave this barrier up. And instead of engaging our culture, instead of engaging in real communication, I'm not talking about you know statements on Facebook or, or just really short tweets. And I'm talking about engaging people in actual conversations about their life and, and where they're at and, and where they're looking for, for hope and joy and satisfaction and, and having those conversations with people. We, we want to kind of leave that barrier up and, and just kind of rub elbows with them. And so we resort to uh, the way I'm going to, to speak to people is through maybe bumper stickers or, or T-shirts or coffee mugs, and, and, and that kind of idea where we are in the culture and maybe people outside of the church, people that aren't believers, will, will kind of pick up on our, our language and our, our coffee mug and our bumper sticker and they'll see something, they'll see some truth in that and they'll pick up on that and absorb that and, and then God will change their life. And, and, and so we've kind of subtly replaced discipleship for this approach. And so that's not... God's design, and the problem with that is when we do that, when we just kind of make these blanket statements and, and hope people kind of absorb that, is who's providing the context? Because it's just like this meme where we've put something out there, but we haven't given it context. We haven't given them where it's coming from, what it really means, how to interpret that and apply that to their own life and their own situation. Just to give you an example of what I'm talking about here, um, one of the most popular verses that I, I, I think people do this with is Philippians 4.13. It says, I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. And I, I've kind of shared a, a cartoon before of this man that's, that's trying to open this pickle jar, and he's really struggling, and, and you can just see he's got his teeth grit, and he can't get the pickle jar to move, and he's thinking, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And his wife is over in the corner, and she's like, I, I don't think that's what that verse means. And, and we laugh at that, but, but really, that's the idea that, that people have when we kind of just post things out there for, for people to find and, and hope they get it. And so when we think about this verse, one of the most popular places, one of the, the, the places that we see it most is with, with athletes. And so we have these people that say, well, their, their thinking is, I can hit a home run through him who strengthens me. Or I'll be able to catch this 30-yard touchdown pass through him that strengthens me. And they've missed something. Because when we look at this verse and we look at it in its context, we, we find that this verse is not about our ability. It, it's about our, our attitude. It, it's not about something that we're going to do in the future, but it's about being content right now in, in the present. And so when you take this verse and you look at the whole passage of, of where it's at, it says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Now at length you have received... I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received your concern from me, for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. So that's what Paul is talking about. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. And so when we put that back into the context of, of what Paul is actually saying, it radically changes things, guys. Because Paul is not talking about what he is able to do. He's talking about where he finds his satisfaction in life. And Paul says, listen, there, there are wealthy people that seem to have it made, and they're not happy. They're, they're not content. They're missing something. And there are people that don't have as much as, the, as those wealthy people that are living the simple life that are unhappy. They're, they're looking for something. And Paul says that we, we all think that the grass is greener on the other side. Every one of us can look at someone around us and, and think to ourselves, man, if I had 
the money that they had or the job that they had or if I lived in the house that they lived in or if I had the family that they had, I'd be happy. And Paul's saying, no, that's, that's not how it works. It's how we, we think it works. But our happiness is not based on that things. I, I have found the secret. I have found the key to being content. And it's Jesus. And so Paul says, I, I can find myself in abundance and wealth and riches and I'm content. And if I find myself in poverty, if I find myself in need, I'm still content. Because no matter what cards I have in my hand, I'm satisfied. Because I know Jesus. And if I'm rich, I know that's not where I really find my wealth. If I don't hit a home run, that's not where I find my worth. If the operation or the medicine is working and it's, it's healing my body and, and so it looks like I'm going to overcome this disease, that's great, but that's not my final hope in life. It's Jesus. And that's what Paul is talking about here. And, and, and people do similar things with this passage in Mark that we're going to talk about this morning. What does Jesus mean? When he says, whatever you ask in prayer, if you believe that, you you will receive it. Is Jesus giving us this blank check and saying, okay, you name it and claim it. And you could probably finish that sentence in your mind. Because that's what a lot of people put forth. And what do this fig tree and this mountain that Jesus is talking about, what what is that? What's up with that? What does that have to do with anything? And so as we start... Mark 11, uh, I mentioned last week that we're getting into uh, the last week of Jesus' life. He's heading to the cross. He's going to Jerusalem. He's going to be tried. He's going to be handed over to the authorities. He's going to be um, crucified. And and so this is this final week of Jesus' life. And it begins, we didn't read this part, but it begins with this uh, triumphal entry into Jerusalem where we, if you've seen... Easter dramas and and, um, seeing pictures of this where people are waving palm branches and they're saying, uh, Hosanna, which means save me, help me, Lord. And they're saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they're worshiping and and praising God. And and Jesus comes in on this donkey. And so uh, he makes this triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Uh, We read in Mark that he goes into the temple. That's going to be important later. He, He goes into the temple He looks around in the temple and he goes back to Bethany. And now we're going to pick up the next day here in Mark 11. And Jesus is going to again head to the temple. And he's going to see this this fig tree. And he's going to to curse this fig tree. He's going to go into the temple and he's going to cleanse the temple. Uh, And then when he leaves, he's going to again stop by this fig tree and kind of explain some things to his disciples. And so in your Bible, it may even have headings that kind of break this into blocks. Those weren't there originally, uh, just in case you didn't know. But it it breaks it into blocks, and it talks about Jesus cursing the fig tree, Him cleansing the temple, and then Him teaching a a lesson to His disciples. And so the first thing that we want to look at is is this fig tree. Um, The fig tree is an Old Testament symbol for Israel. Um, Just like when we talk about America, um, if you saw an American flag... Um, or we have these icons and symbols that we, we use, maybe a, a bald eagle. Um, maybe if you saw the old war posters where Uncle Sam needs you, and those are images that represent uh, America, the Statue of, of Liberty, the Liberty Bell. And so we have these images. And, and in the Old Testament, a, a fig tree represented the nation of Israel. And so uh, it was often a really a, a barometer of the spiritual health of, of Israel. And so... Often when, when God would speak to the prophets and they would talk about a fig tree, it was letting Israel know um, kind of where they were at with God. And, and so we find um, verses like this in, in Hosea 9.10. It says, Like grapes in the wilderness I found Israel, like the first fruit on the fig tree in its first season I saw your fathers. But they came to Baal Peor and consecrated themselves to the things of shame and became detestable like the, the thing that they loved. 
And so Jesus is on his way to enter the temple and it says that he is hungry because Jesus is fully God and fully man and he got hungry just like we get hungry. Um, and so he comes to this uh, place where he sees this fig tree in the distance and he sees leaves on the tree and so he goes closer to it to, to see if it has any fruit and it doesn't have any fruit on it. And, and we see this comment um, in Mark where it says it was not the season for figs. And to really understand what's going on here, we, we have to know a little bit about the, the fig tree. Um, when Mark says it's not the season for figs, what he's talking about is that it wasn't time to, to harvest those figs. Okay, so they're not full, uh, mature figs on this tree. Um, in, in March, in Israel, the, the fig tree would begin to produce these smaller nubs. Um, they're, they're called pegum. And so um, you can read about this in, in, in Solomon. He mentions the pegum. And, and so these were, were green nubs that would eventually turn into these big mature figs. And they were small and they were, they were green and they were sour. But you, you could eat them. People would eat them. Uh, but the thing about it is um, the pegum really begins to develop before the leaves on the fig tree. And so if you see a fig tree with leaves on it, when, when you approached it, you would at least expect to see these small little nodules that would become figs. And when Jesus goes to this fig tree, it's just leaves. There's, there's no pagum on there that would, would turn into the fruit that, that people would pick and eat. And so Jesus is expecting to find something. And He comes and, and He doesn't. And, and so there's, there's this problem now. Because this tree is not doing what it was created to do. It's not producing any fruit. And we, we see in Luke 13, um, Jesus gives this parable about a, a fig tree. And He talks about this man that owns a, a field and has fig trees. And um, he's the owner of, of this place where they're getting crops from. And he has this fig tree and it's not producing figs. And he waits a year and it doesn't produce figs. He, he waits another year it doesn't produce figs. For three years, he, he waits to see some fruit. And, and, and he doesn't see any fruit. The, the, the tree never produces. And he, so he, he tells his servant, he says, just cut the tree down. We're, we're wasting soil. And the servant says, listen, I know it hasn't produced any fruit the, the past three years, but let me dig around the tree. Let me fertilize it. Let me, let me give it some extra care, some water, and, and show it a little extra love. And, and then next year, if it doesn't produce, then, then you can cut it down. And so we see these parables that Jesus gives about this, the fig tree. And He's talking about the spiritual condition of, of Israel. And Jesus is saying that this tree doesn't have fruit. And so he, he curses it and He says, no one will eat fruit from you ever again. And so it's symbolic of Israel that was supposed to bear fruit. That was their, their purpose. But in reality, it's kind of like in, in Mark 7, uh, when Jesus is talking to the religious leaders and He says, you know, th these people, they, they honor Me with their lips, but their hearts are, are far from Me. On the outside, they, they've got these leaves. They've got signs like they're, they're doing something. It looks like they, they should be producing fruit, but there's no fruit. Because something's wrong on the inside. Something's wrong on the inside. It was a perfect description of what had become of Israel's religious system. The Temple Mount in Israel sat on 35 acres of land. That's about 25 football fields, if you need an image to kind of put in your head. Um, most of that space belonged to what is known as the Court of the Gentiles. You can see those big square areas there. Um, I tried to give you a, a little heads up about what, that, what we're talking about here, but the way that the temple area was broken down was you had this big outer section that was the court of the Gentiles, um, and that is as far as a, a Gentile could come. They couldn't go in any further into the temple complex. And then the next area that you had would be the court of, of women, and that's as far as uh, how far women could go in. And then you had the, the court of Israel where the, the men of Israel would be allowed to go and, and bring sacrifices to the priest. And then the priest had an area that they could go in that no one else could 
um, go in. That was the court of the priest. And then finally, um, you had the Holy of Holies where uh, the priest would take the, the sacrifice of atonement one day a year and they would be allowed to go into the Holy of Holies where the presence of, of God was supposed to be. And so you have all of this space. This sat on 35 acres of land, um, 25 football fields. And you see that the, the largest section is the court of the Gentiles. And when we look at Israel's purpose, going back all the way to, to Genesis, um, that's why we went through Genesis, guys. It's, it's very important. But when we go through Genesis, in Genesis chapter 12, when God is, is speaking to Abraham, what's the purpose of Israel, right? He says, I'm, I'm going to take you and, and give you a land. I'm going to, to bless you and, and turn you into a, a nation of people. And the whole purpose of this is so you'll be a blessing to other nations. I'm going to bless you so you can bless others. I'm going to bless you and, and be your God so you can point other people to the, the one true God of Israel. That's their, their purpose. And so they have all of this space at the temple. And what do they do with it? They turned it into a strip mall. They turned it into a, a place to sell goods. And so at the, the time here, um, people needed to buy sacrifices. Um, the population in Israel at Passover exploded. It, it went from about 2,000 people to about 2 million people for a few weeks. And so what happens is you have all of these people that are coming up to Israel to, to worship that are, are traveling for two, three, four days to, to get there, and they wouldn't risk bringing their, their own sacrifice because um, a lot can happen in two or three days and, and you didn't want your sacrifice to, to get injured on the trip because they're not driving in a, a car. They're walking and, and riding animals, mostly walking. And so you wouldn't want your animal to, to be injured because then you couldn't sacrifice it because it had to be with, without blemish. And so they would not bring a, a sacrifice with them. Uh, they would purchase their sacrifice when, when they got to the temple. And so... Israel, the, the religious leaders said, okay, we have all of this open space that's for the Gentiles. Um, we can't bring these animals into these other places because they're, they're going to uh, use the restroom and it's going to stink. And, and so we can't bring them in here, but we'll put them in the court of the Gentiles where, where people can sell and, and buy, and, and then they'll have a sacrifice. In 66 AD, uh, Josephus tells us that on the day of Passover, 250,000 Lambs were sacrificed during Passover week. And what would happen is people would mark up the prices. And Mark mentions doves. And so the price of a dove in your hometown, um, maybe it would be a dollar to, to buy a dove, to, to be able to have as a pet or, or eat or sacrifice. Um, but when they got to the temple, they a dove would cost like $15. And the dove was supposed to be, you know, this is what the, the poor person can offer to God. And so they would mark these prices up. It was price gouging. Not only that, but people had to, to pay a temple tax. Um, we we kind of talked about this a, a couple of weeks ago in Exodus 21 when we were talking about the word ransom. Um, remember, that's a, a price for life. It's the cost of, of life. And God tells Moses when they are, are building the temple that every person in Israel, every man in Israel, every year was supposed to pay a ransom to God, a, a temple tax. And this is what the Levitical priesthood would uh, use for their worship and, and for leaving over the next year. And uh, the cost of that was a, a half of a shekel, which was around two days' wages. Uh, the problem is they're, they're in Roman territory, right? And so their, their currency has pictures of, of Caesar on it. And so what they did was, was they would say, well, we can't take that because it has Caesar's picture on it. You have to use um, the currency that the temple uses. And so they would set up these exchange tables and, and people would have to, to come in and, and exchange uh, Roman money for temple money. And so they would jack up the exchange rate during Passover. Because all of this money was coming in and, and they could make some extra profit. And so that's what they did. They, they would jack the prices up. And the thing is, when you look at that, when you look at how the religious leaders and how the, the temple activity 
uh, all of that that took place, what, what does that portray about God? The idea becomes that um, you buy access to God. That if you work really hard or if you're really wealthy, then, then you can get closer to God. It's kind of like this idea of, um, you know, if you've ever been to a concert um, and, and you've bought tickets maybe online to, to go to a concert and they, they show you the uh, Coliseum or the auditorium or, or wherever you're going to see this person sing. And, you know, you, you can buy the seats that are way up here, uh, the nosebleed section, and, and you can go and listen to the music. But if you pay a little bit more, you, you can have a little bit better seat. And if you pay a little bit more than that, maybe you, you can sit on floor level and, and be pretty close. And then if you pay even more, maybe you can go backstage. Maybe you can be a, a VIP and, and actually meet the artist. So this whole idea that, that they're showing in, in the temple is the more money that you have, the, the more that you bring, the, the better chance is that you will be accepted. And these were people that were, were supposed to be a lot. They were supposed to point people to God. And, and we see that they're, they're putting up a, a, a barrier. I've been studying in Exodus, and, and it's really, it really goes along with this. Because when Moses goes before Pharaoh, God says, I, I want you to, to go before Pharaoh, and, and I want you to tell him to let my people go so they can worship me. I, I want you to let them go from the, the slavery and the bondage and the oppression that they're in, so they can, they can come and, and worship me. And guys, at this point in the temple system, they've replaced worship with another form of oppression. They've replaced, replaced worship with, you, you have to have all of this money, you have to, to come and you have to buy, and you have to scrape your way to God. It's the total opposite of what God establishes in Israel. And so Jesus comes in, and he looks around and he says, you know, my house is supposed to be a house of prayer. And all of this place, the court of the Gentiles, this is supposed to be a place where they can, they can pray, where they can come closer to the one true God. And, and you've turned it into a den of robbers. When you think about a, a den of, of robbers, he's not just saying this is the place where you're taking advantage of people. He's saying this is the den of this is a place where the, the people that are taking advantage of people can go and be safe. Because you're, you're accepting it. You're overlooking it and, and saying it's, it's perfectly acceptable. There's nothing wrong with it. And it's not about prayer anymore. Now, now it's about profit. Now it's about ourself. Again, it's, it's turned in on ourself. And so Jesus gets angry. And He drives these people out. And this is where, where I can't get stuck here. Um, and so I, I just want to give some, some brief comments. Um, I, I said pay attention when Jesus goes in the first day and, and looks around. Because the first thing that we need to correct that a lot of people get wrong about this is this was not some first time Jesus goes into the temple and he has this angry, violent outburst. Okay? Jesus went in the day before and he looked around and he saw the problem. And he goes back and he comes back with a, a plan. It's not just this violent emotional outburst that, that Jesus has. And in the book of John, we actually find that um, while he was gone, he, he, he made a whip to go in and, and drive the animals with. Um, this was not a, a violent act. Even though Jesus had this whip, he, he didn't whip people. He didn't harm individuals. When he went into the temple, what, what do we, if, you know, we're, we live in Wilkes County. Um, people have all kinds of animals. If an animal needs nudging, what do you do, Fry? Yeah, you, you, you give it some motivation. And, and so Jesus, when he makes this whip, he, he's using that to motivate these animals to, to move. Okay? And the problem is, and, and it's crazy because... Sometimes when you study stuff and, and things just interlock and, and go together, it's just mind-blowing. But I was telling Amanda the other night that this is, this is why there's a, a problem 
when God says, don't make any idols and don't make any graven images, um, that even can apply to, to art. There's nothing wrong with, with art. There's nothing wrong with depicting Jesus in these different places. But what happens, the danger is we see this art and it begins to influence how we interpret Scripture. Are you following me? Because there are pictures of Jesus with a whip and He's hitting people. It's not what the text says. But people look at that image and then they come to Scripture and say, okay, this is what was going on because I've seen the picture. There wasn't a camera there, guys. And so when we look at this text, and it talks about Jesus flipping the, the money tables over. It's not like Jesus was in a bar fight. You think about prodding lambs and, and uh, cattle and, and different animals and, and moving them out of the temple. There's going to be some tables turn over. Okay, so we can't say, well, Jesus went in and flipped everything over and He was in this violent outburst. We can't say that. Mark is giving this description of how Jesus comes in and He drives these people out. And so there's, there's some, I'm going to be honest, this is a hard text to, to look at and, and think through. But I can tell you this for certain. When we look at this, it doesn't justify going to some other convenience store or commercial place and destroying their property. It doesn't justify going to a place and taking someone's life or um, mistreating an individual because Jesus doesn't do that here. And so it's erroneous for us to take that and apply it to some of the, the things we've seen in our culture today. Because Jesus is, is not saying it's okay to do that. And the big thing that we miss, the big thing, is this was His house. It was His property. And He had every right and every authority to do whatever He wanted to do in the temple. And He says this is not acceptable and so he drives them out. And guys, that, that's going to get him killed. We need to understand that because we, we, what, what follows right after this is pe people are going up to Jesus and they're like, dude, what gives you the authority to do this? And Jesus asks them a, a question and, and, and they don't respond. But, but Jesus has all authority because he's God. It's his house. Hopefully I didn't get stuck there for too long, but... I hope you see how, how this relates to our, our culture even today. But this is actually what will get Jesus killed. These religious leaders would, would question Jesus' authority. And the problem is, that this, they didn't even question Him out of a concern for worship. You, you understand that, right? It, it's not like, hey, He corrected us, but let's pay attention. Now what authority do you come in here and do this? They're offended. They're mad. Jesus, how, how dare you interrupt how we're making profit? We're, we're making some serious bank here and, and you're kicking us out and, and, and doing all these things. What gives you the authority to do that? It's about Jesus challenging their kingdom. And the choice that they would have to make is they either crown Him or kill Him. And they would choose to kill Him. Let's see how we can destroy Him. And that's the question that all of us have to make. What, what do we do with Jesus? We, we either crown Him or we kill Him. We either accept Him or, or we reject Him. And so not now, in this text, now we're getting somewhere, okay? Now, now we're, we're seeing what's going on here. And so Jesus leaves the temple and, and He leaves with His disciples and they come back to this fig tree that hasn't had fruit on it and didn't bear fruit. And, and they come up to it and they see it withered and the disciples are amazed and they're, Jesus, what, what, what's going on here? This is, wow. And Jesus looks at them and says, have faith in God. When you have faith in God and believe, then this mountain can be cast into the sea. And here, here's the, the thing we need to see, guys. Because a lot of people will say, just name your mountain, name your, your obstacle, and, and Jesus will remove that. But Jesus is being very specific here. And I don't want to miss it because it's beautiful. What mountain is He standing in front of? 
It's the mountain where the temple's at. It's the mountain where people have tried to scrape their way to the top and they're, they're trying to find access to God. And, and it's this mountain where this temple system that was supposed to be producing fruit hasn't produced fruit. It's this system that is serving as a barrier to God instead of a bridge to God. It's this system of, of, of trying to, to work and not be sure if you even have access to God. And Jesus says, Guys, if you have faith, if you believe in God, if you believe in the work that I'm about to do, then you'll be able to take this mountain and cast it into the sea. I'm about to do something radically different and this whole system is going to be wiped away. If you just believe in me, if you have faith in me, then this obstacle between you and God can be removed. And so if you believe in that kingdom, if, if you acknowledge that kingdom, then you want to be aligned to that kingdom because you're, you're a subject of the king, right? And so then you will say in your prayers, not, not my will, but God's will be done. Not, not, not my will, but the true king, let his will be done. And also you will forgive other people because you'll, you'll say, when, when I look to the cross... When I see how much that God has forgiven me for that I, I didn't deserve, how can I not forgive other people when I have been forgiven so much in, in my own life? So it's not just this, this idea of lip service, but it's actually changing who we are and aligning us to God's kingdom. So Jesus is saying, whatever you ask, when you, when you ask for access to things of my kingdom, it's yours. It's yours. You can have that. It's not a, a blank check as we see uh, and, and try to make God as this genie in a bottle. But it's faith in God's kingdom that will uh, align us and inform us on, on how we should pray, how we should live out our life. Really teaching us to, to pray for, for kingdom things. And I hope that you see that this morning. Um, and just to close, if we talk about, you know, how, how do we apply this? That's a lot of different directions we could go with this. So, so how do we apply this to our lives? First of all, we, we need to always examine ourselves. I need to examine myself. You, you need to examine yourself as, as individuals and then also um, corporately as a, a body of believers in a local church. And ask the question, am I a bridge to God, or am I a barrier to God? Am I, am I a bridge to God, or am I a barrier to God in other people's lives? Secondly, whose kingdom do I belong to? Whose kingdom am I concerned with? Am I, am I trusting in, in my works and, and me um, kind of outweighing the, the good with uh, and the bad and, and tipping the scales, or, or, or am I trusting that I could never earn it. I could never be good enough and, and do good enough and trusting in the, the work of Jesus and His death in my place. And then finally, do my prayers reflect a concern for, for my kingdom or for God's kingdom? Is my, my prayer life focused on your, your will be done or is it a lot of, God, I, I want this in my life because I'm really concerned about my kingdom and, and not yours. So that's the, the questions that we, we need to, to ask ourselves when we walk away from this this morning. Let's, uh, let's bow our heads. Father, I, I thank you for your word. Um, God, I thank you for how you teach us. And God, how, how you, you love us. so thankful that we can know you because you, you gave your life for us. Um, this is not something that we have to earn. It's not something that we have to buy because we could never afford it and, and we could never do enough to, to earn it. But God, you, you just offer it freely for us to just take. God, I, I pray that we don't take that for granted. And that we would live lives that represent you. 
that we would be bridges in, instead of barriers to you. And uh, God, I, I just pray for these people um, that are here, the people that are, are watching online, that you would just continue to speak to us throughout the week. Um, God, that you would be with our mission partners, uh, that you would continue to sustain them and, and give them strength and provide for their needs. God, that, that they would see fruit for their labor. Um, God, I, I pray for the things that are going to, to happen here in the future. Um, that you would lead us and guide us, and that we would just follow you closely, um, that we would be the, the people that you would have us to be, that would just um, represent who you are, and uh, we would be able to share the, the good news with others around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, I hope you guys have a good week, and uh, kind of spread the word um, about the Sunday school starting at the beginning of March. Um, some some cool stuff coming up because, again, starting Sunday school is, is awesome, and a lot of you I know have missed that um, time together. And then uh, also remember uh, Rod is coming in March to, to share uh, with us as well. So looking forward to that. And uh, continue to, to pray for one another and to reach out to one another this week. Love you guys. Have a good week.